So I get myself situated here. We'll be good to go. All right, could somebody please catch us up on where we are at in the book of Exodus? What's going on right now? We're in Egypt. All right, we're still in Egypt. That's a good answer. What's going on in Egypt? Who's talking? Moses is trying to get the people out, right? He's gone to Pharaoh once, and how did that go? As expected, right? <laughs> yeah. At least God was expecting it. I don't know exactly what Moses maybe was expecting, but God told him this is going to happen. Um, so their burdens get heavier, right? They now have to go out and collect the straw. It's not just brought to them, but they're still expected to make the same quota. Um, how do the leaders of Israel take this news? And these beatings, really, they're getting beat for it. They didn't like it, so who do they blame? They blame Moses and Aaron, right? Remember, when Moses and Aaron first show up, they say, hey, this is great, this is amazing, Yahweh has sent you, awesome, let's do this. And after the first no, it's, why, what are you guys doing? You know, you're cursing the name of God, this is, you're just a stench now to everybody around us. And so what does Moses do? Who does he go talk to about this? The Lord, right? And is Moses really blaming God for anything? He's questioning, right? And as Adam told us, or right, brought to light for us on Sunday, is it okay to question God? Up to a point, right? Yeah, right? As long as you are reverent in your questioning, you are just actually trying to understand, right? Then that's okay. We see that throughout all the Bible. My favorite book to look at, and this is in Job, right? You look at Job, and I read Job, and I'm like, man, Job is just running his mouth, and he doesn't know when to shut up, and actually it takes God to finally just come down to him and say, all right, you want to talk? Let's talk. But at the very end of Job, what does it say about him? It says, in all this, Job was blameless. And I turn back in those 30 chapters, and I'm like, I don't see blameless here, but in God's eyes, he is. He's just, Job is just questioning, and that's fine. And so when Moses is questioning, does God come down hard on Moses and say, how dare you? No. Exactly, right? And that's, that's a very good point, right? We're not just having an Old Testament example of this, but we have New Testament Scripture telling us it is okay to ask God why. He will reveal why. Very good point, Steve. Um, and so that brings us now all the way up to chapter 7. And we're going to see what was Moses' last objection at the end of chapter 6, one we've heard before. Speech, right? In other words, he's asking, are you sure you have the right guy, right? I, I, I saw the speech problem. Um, if somebody could read chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, let's see what God answers to Moses here. Exodus 7, 1 through 7. Yes, through seven, please. Yes, thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right, so chapter seven there, it says, and what speaks to Moses? And what does your translation say? Mine says, the Lord, right? And if it's in all capitals, we know it means what? Yahweh, right? There's that word again, the actual name that God has given Moses. It says, and Yahweh speaks to Moses. And what does he tell Moses? I've made you a what to Pharaoh? A God to Pharaoh, right? At this point, do you think Moses is feeling like, in our relationship here between me and Pharaoh, I am a God to him? You think Moses is feeling that way right now? No, right? I mean, Moses is thinking, how am I a God? 
God, right? But has, in this section here, have we seen this speech really already from God to Moses? Have we already seen this in Exodus? Yeah, back in Exodus chapter 4, right, in the burning bush, when Moses says, I don't speak well, what does God tell him? Well, I'm going to make you like a god to Pharaoh, right? And how is he doing that? He's giving him a prophet. Who's his prophet? Aaron, right? He's giving him a spokesman, right? Remember, God said, I'm going to give you Aaron. You're going to tell Aaron, and Aaron's going to speak for you as you speak for me, right? And so in that relationship, you're like a god to Pharaoh. Because again, how does Pharaoh treat his people when he wants to speak to them? He sends out a messenger, sends out a prophet, right? Because who is Pharaoh to the Egyptians' eyes? A god, right? And this is going to be important as we get into this chapter, that idea. Um, what other kind of things do you see there? What does God say, Moses, this is what's going to happen? What kind of things are going to happen? First off, how is Pharaoh going to react to all this? Hard in his heart, right? We've talked about what that means. So is Pharaoh going to be favorable to Moses in all this? No, right? <laughs> Again, has God already told Moses this? Yes. But it's just God, Yahweh, reassuring his servant. Right? That's what God's doing here. Do we ever need that in our lives? Yeah, we do, right? Like Levi mentioned in his talk tonight, do we always walk around with just such great confidence that we don't need God or anybody else to ever reassure us of what we're doing? No, right? <laughs> we constantly need that. Right? We constantly need to be going back to God in prayer and going back to God in the Bible and saying, I need reassurance. I, this isn't turning out the way I hoped it would, right? And does God always say, hey, everybody's going to love what you say? No, and that's why he's telling Moses here. But what? Pharaoh's going to harden his heart, but what's going to happen? I'm going to multiply my signs, my wonders, and who is going to know that I am God? Pharaoh and all of Egypt, right? This isn't just a, hey, I'm proving myself to Pharaoh. That's not God's ultimate goal. God's ultimate goal is what? To prove himself to who? The whole world, really, at that point, right? The Egyptians, we're going to see, right, when you get into Joshua and Judges, the lands of Canaan had already heard about all this and they know about it, right? God's plan is bigger than what Moses is actually seeing here. Yes, it's to free his people, but ultimately is to make his name known, to make it known that Yahweh is the God, the one. Any thoughts, comments on these first seven verses? Yeah, exactly. Very good point. Um, and it's interesting that you bring that up. You see that throughout all of Scripture, that theme, right? Anytime they recount Israel's history, look at Acts 2, right? Peter's giving the very first, quote, sermon, right? And what does he bring up? The God who brought you out of Egypt, right? He, it's for centuries, for thousands of years, that these, what we're reading about here in Exodus, is going to be constantly told, constantly using as a proven point for the people of Israel. Very good point. Any other thoughts? Verse 6, I was going to get there. What does it say? And Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded, so they did. Have you ever heard or read that before yet in the Old Testament? So-and-so did? Noah, right? Um, Genesis 6, 22. Somebody read that for me. Somebody turn there and read that. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22. He did everything that God commanded him. What do you get from that? You listen, yeah, God tells you to do something, you better do it, right? 
when God is planning on saving his people, what does it take besides God and his power? Obedience from somebody, right? For God to save the world in Noah's day, Noah had to do what God commanded him to do. If Noah decided to go off and build the ark his own way, would it have worked? I don't think so either, right? I think it'd be pretty safe to say that. Yeah, Adam. Yep. Yeah, and in fact, you see in James, right? James has that whole discussion about faith and works, and James ends up proving you need both, right? It's not just, oh, I have my works or I have my faith. No, you need both of them combined, right? Noah's faith and Moses and Aaron's faith here, right? All right, God, this is what you said. This is what we're going to do. As you watch Moses now throughout his time here in Egypt, and Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't ever see God having to reassure Moses again while they're still in Egypt. Or at least having to give him the same kind of pep talk like, hey, this is going to be okay, this is what I'm going to do. I haven't seen that. I could be wrong. So when I read this, right, like you're saying, Moses and Aaron now have the faith, the confidence of, all right, this is what God said, let's do it, right? And this is all going to work out the way God wants it to work out as we follow through with what he does. Now, how can we apply that to ourselves? It's pretty obvious. Well, I was thinking about uh, how we view God's word. And, you know, it obviously has commands to do certain things. It has prohibitions against certain things. But we have to have faith that God's word will do what it's supposed to. Yep. Uh, and I was thinking about in 1 Corinthians 1 that a lot of people look at at God's word, the message of the cross, as false, foolishness. But we, we, we're putting our confidence in the one that spoke these words, who has been fastening with us all these many centuries. Yeah, very good point, right? It is. It's. Can people tell if what you're selling them, whatever it is, if you honestly believe it? Yeah, everybody has that good, pretty good indicator of, I, you may be selling me this, but you don't really believe it yourself. You're just trying to get me to join, right? And it's the same when we go out and tell the world today about Jesus, right? They can tell, hey, do you really believe this? Right, whether it's by our actions, by the way we act, by even just the words we say, right? It's, if you don't have that faith, it's not going to work, right? Any other thoughts on these verses before we move on? Eighty and eighty-three. <laughs> Who in here is eighty? Jim, you can't question anymore. Sorry. Right? Yes, Tyler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> commanded them. Yeah. Don't worry about the yeah. last five chapters, that were, six chapters that we've already gone through on this, right? Yep. Yes, very good. All right, moving on. Let's look at verses 8 through 13. Pharaoh is going to get another talk into here. Somebody can read verses 8 through 13 of chapter 7.
All right, perfect. Okay, so Moses and Aaron, they go back before Pharaoh, and what does Pharaoh want from them? A sign, a miracle. Okay, if you say you are from your God, right, Yahweh of Israel, if you say you're from him, prove it. Okay, seems like a logical request. So what does Aaron do? Throws his rod down, right? Now, did God already tell Moses this is going to happen? Yes, right? At least twice that we can see. I mean, this section starts off with, God says, when you go there, this is what's going to happen. But we also, again, see it back in chapter 4, right? God says, here's a staff. You're going to throw it down when it asks. Now, my question for you, right? This is the first sign, right, that Moses gives to Pharaoh, that he is from God. Is Here's my staff, bam. Is Pharaoh able to do this? Are his magicians able to do this as well? Of some sort, right? So in that moment, what is Pharaoh proving to everybody else in that room? I'm just like their God, right? I am just like their God. Look at what my magicians can do, my prophets can do too. They can throw down staffs and make snakes. And it's a plurality, right? It says they throw down their staffs, right? Not just one. So it's even better, right? I'm not just making one snake. I'm making, yeah, until, right? And we'll get there. We'll get there. So they throw down their staffs. Question. Again, right, we're trying to apply all this to us. We've kind of made this analogy already in this class, right? Adam has and I have too of, right, when you're looking at the big picture, you can kind of see this as a war between God and Satan right, a spiritual war for God's people, Israel, physically. Can Satan use things to make them look like they're from God? If God allows him to do it. Um, somebody, I have two verses here, somebody turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And somebody else turn to Matthew chapter 7. And if you're in Matthew 7, just hold on there. We'll get there in a minute. Matthew 11, somebody look at verses uh, 12 through 15. Second Corinthians 11, 12 through 15. Everybody went to Matthew, apparently. Uh, 11 uh, verses 12 through 15. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Okay. What does Paul say here in 2 Corinthians 11? He says, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, and other people are going to be doing what they're doing, but they're what? What does he call them? Deceivers, false apostles, um, right? They transform themselves into uh, false apostles, deceitful workers. And he says, does it surprise Paul that they do this? No. Why? He says, Yeah, exactly, right? It's, it's one of those obvious points, right, of here's a big sign that says sin right here, right? Is everybody going to go, hey, let's go run into there? No. But if it says joy right here, fun right here, whatever, right, pick your thing, and it looks good, and it acts good, well, maybe it is okay, right? Again, go all the way back to creation, Eve looked at the fruit and saw that it was what? Good for eating, pleasing to the eye, right? 
Satan doesn't just stand there and go, hi, I'm Satan, right? I'm going to be trying to deceive you today. No, he doesn't do that, right? And we see that played out perfectly here in Exodus 7. God throws down his staff, Pharaoh throws down his staves, and everybody goes, he's the same, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 7, so then the question is, right, how can we tell what is from God and what is not from God? Uh, Matthew chapter 7, if somebody can read verses 16 through 23. Let's look at what Jesus tells us. Uh, do 15, 15 through 20, sorry. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. All right, perfect. Okay, how does Jesus describe false prophets? They're what? Wolves dressed like sheep. Again, right, they're not going to stand out. It's going to blend in. It's going to look like everything else around them. That is what Satan does. That's what the deceiver does. It's let me look like everything else around you, but be a little different until you don't realize it until it's too late. How does Jesus tell us what is good and what is not good? How can we tell? by their fruits, right, by their actions. What are they producing? What are they actually saying, right? Does that actually take some thinking on our part? Yeah, right? <laughs> if something's not just blatantly standing out, you're going to have to actually think about it. Think about it. Compare it back to what the Creator, what God says. So, come back now to Exodus 7. What fruit do we see that shows what is from God and what is not from God? What do we see happen with all the snakes? Aaron swallows them up. What is God showing right there? His power, right? Basically saying, that's cute, but now let me actually show you what real power is and eat them. And like Steve said, it's more than one, at least all indications prove that it's more than just one snake this one snake eats, right? And if you know anything about snakes, they usually eat one and then they're done for a while. So for this snake to eat more than one is kind of a big deal. Um, any thoughts, questions on this from you guys on this section? Yes. Sorry. Very good point. Um, and what's funny is when you actually start looking up a commentary on this section of verses, everybody goes to, how did the snakes get made by the magicians, right? Like, that's where everybody runs to, is the unknown. Honestly, we're never told, right? We can surmise, we can make, but again, the Scripture never tells us. What the Scripture does tell us, though, whatever it was they were doing, God was going to beat it, no matter what it was, right? Whether it was satan whether it was a sleight of hand trick whatever didn't matter god was going to win this battle any other thoughts
and they could do these kinds of things. But God is in control of that, and they choose to allow it. Yeah, kind of like what Rick said at the very beginning of this, right? If God allows it, right? It's all under God's control. If God allows it, then he's going to let it happen, right? Eventually, though, but you see here, God allows it, whatever it is, and then he says, all right, enough. Time to prove who I am. Yes, wrong. Yeah, no, and that's a very good point, too, right? Kind of like what Randall was saying, too. God's not just proving himself to the Egyptians. He's proving himself to Israel as well, of I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that you've been hearing about. I am here. I am he. I am here. I am Yahweh. I am coming to save you. Very good point. Thank you. All right, let's move on here. Let's finish this up. Uh, chapter 7, if somebody could read 14 through 25. Let's get into the, quote, fun stuff. 14 through 25, if somebody could take that. Uh, all the way through the end of the chapter, please. All right, perfect. Okay, so what do we have here? We have, quote-unquote, the first plague. What is it? Turning water into blood. What water? What river is this that we're talking about? The Great River, right? The Nile River. Egypt is built along the Nile River, especially ancient Egypt, right? All its cities and towns were along the Nile River. Egypt is a huge country back then, but it's all built along the Nile River because that is where you can live, right? You can't grow things there. Um, What's the significance? Why would God want to, this to be the first miracle, you think, or the first plague? Why do you think that? Why do you think God says, first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn the river to blood? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, right? Like you brought the point of the Nile, right? It has a flood season every year. There's a flood season for it. And that is extremely important to the Egyptians. 
If you're going to live, if you're going to have a good year, you need that river to flood every year, especially in ancient Egypt. If you notice here, um, in verse 15, it says, get to Pharaoh in the morning, he goes to the water, right? He goes down to the water, whether it's to bathe like the princess did earlier, we're not sure. But one thing we do know of, every year, right, what is Pharaoh considered again to the Egyptians? A god. Every year, the Pharaoh, no matter who it was, would go down to the river, perform a ritual, and that was to supposedly keep everything in order and cause the Nile to flood again, right? Because he is a god. Um, there's a, one historian says, Unas, who was a Pharaoh, one of them wrote, he said, it, Unas is he who caused the land to be underwater after he came out of the lake, right? The Egyptians credited the flooding of the Nile to that Pharaoh, whoever it was. Why? Because he is the God, okay? Does anybody know what God was associated with the Nile River? Hepta. Who's the really big one, though, that actually died in the Nile, according to the Egyptians? You all know it, you just don't know it. Osiris. Have you guys heard that name before? Osiris, he's the Egyptian god of the dead and fertility. Okay, he, he gets two titles. He's so cool. What's interesting about Osiris is, according to Egyptian mythology, he is the firstborn of the earth and the sky. Right? He's the firstborn, and the way he dies is he's drowned in the Nile by, one, by his brother Set, who was jealous of him. Right? Brothers, you know, what can you do? But that's where his, car, that's where his tomb laid, was in the Nile. And it was actually Osiris... Right, who would cause it to flood and recede. And whoever was king at that time was considered Hepta. And when that Pharaoh died, he then took on Osiris, right? When God first talks to Moses, let's tie us back to Exodus, right? Cool Egyptian mythology. If you're a geek like me, you think that's amazing. Yeah, I got Adam with me. All right. God says, I'm going to do miracles. I'm going to do so great of miracles, I'm eventually going to do what to the Egyptians? Kill their firstborn. To the Egyptians, who's the firstborn god? Osiris. So what God is doing here, and again, if you're in ancient Egypt, you get this, right? We read this as Americans, we're like, all right, he turns the water to blood, right? There's life, that's what they depend on, that's amazing. It's the Nile, this huge river. All of it's amazing. But to the Egyptians, it has a greater significance because in their eyes, he just overpowered their main god is what he just did. Okay? Just like with the stabs, how he conquered Pharaoh with the stabs by proving my snake's bigger than your snake, he's now saying, your river, your god, is controlled by me. Now, why does Pharaoh harden his heart by this? It tells us why. Yeah. Yeah, right? It's pretty much, it's, God and Moses attacking everything that Pharaoh thinks he is, right? He's a God, he's a conduit, he's a whatever. And God's saying, no, you're not. I'm in control here, Steve. Yeah, exactly, right? We see here, right, this first plague, his magicians can do the same thing. So Pharaoh's thinking, hey, that's great. Right? But look, they can make water into blood in their own cisterns, water, things like that. I want you to watch as we go through these plagues on next week, and then as Adam picks it up as well, watch the escalation God has with these plagues. These first couple of them, and these first couple miracles, we're going to see a pattern here. God does it, it's amazing, and then Pharaoh's magicians can come in and do the same thing, and Pharaoh goes, eh, 
right? Yes, wrong. Very good point, right? And again, it's this idea of cleansing, of washing. Yes, Joan. <laughs> right, yeah, again, right? It's this idea of Pharaoh doing things to kind of spite himself, right? If you have magicians that can turn water to blood, why don't you just then take the blood and make it back into water, right? It's kind of like with the straw thing, right? It's, well, I'm just going to prove you despite myself. Um, now, question. With this plague, how long does it last, first off? Seven days. So does that mean now nobody has any drinking water for seven days in Egypt? They're digging for it. They're digging for it, right? So we get the indication of God is not just telling the whole land for seven days no water, right? We see that they're gathering water if they dig around it, okay? How far out? We don't know where they're digging from. We don't know. But apparently they can still dig holes and get water. Now, to me, I don't know about you, but it also even, to me, that even shows more so the power of God. That not only can I do this to the river, right, but I can limit it to, right? In other words, I can control exactly how far this plague is going to go. And again, pay attention to that as we get into these other plagues. You're going to see that as well. Yeah, exactly, right? And back to the idea of attacking the Egyptian gods, right? He's, first thing he does right out of the gate is, I'm hitting your big one. I'm hitting your, quote, firstborn, right where his power is in the Nile. All right, thank you all very much, and we'll pick up on Sunday.